A close call at Virginia Tech. I've had a lot of bad luck in my life when it comes to violent encounters with the wrong sort of people. Though unfortunately, this wasn't the first incident and far from the last. Graduating from a relatively prestigious, still public sort of high school with an emphasis in engineering, I decided without much thought to pursue a degree in engineering in college. In the end, I gained admission to Virginia Tech and headed off to Southwest Virginia in August of 2006. Long story short, it was a big and somewhat difficult adjustment, and it wasn't going quite as well as I would have liked. As an interesting aside, on the very first day of classes, in fact, in my very first college class ever, one of the school staff stuck their heads in the door and told us that classes were cancelled for the day and that we should head back to our dorms and stay there because there may have been a shooter on campus. Wait, what? It turns out, there had been an inmate at the local hospital in town and he had killed a security guard in order to escape and the authorities believed he might head to campus to blend in with the thousands of students. I remember he was caught, but I don't think he was on the campus, I honestly can't remember that part, but it was kind of a weird way to start college. No huge deal, right? Well, more like a very small dress rehearsal for what was to come later. Anyways, fast forward to 8 months later, mid-April. I woke up Monday in my dorm room in Cochrane Hall at about 7.30 if memory serves. Looking out my window to the northeast, I could see across the courtyard to Wes Ambler Johnston and down in the courtyard below was an ambulance. Now you have to understand, Virginia Tech is a huge school. When I went there in 2006 to 2007, there was something like 26,000 students in attendance. Because the school is located in a rural area, they provided basic medical services and EMS on campus. With this many kids running around getting drunk, forgetting to take meds, taking too many meds, having epilepsy, diabetic attacks, etc. It wasn't super uncommon to see an ambulance on campus, so I didn't think much of it. I did check my campus email to make sure everything was okay, and in the absence of any warnings about anything, I pulled some clothes and shoes on and shuffled over to D2, a huge buffet-style dining hall, loved their apple fritters and a $1.70 breakfast to get some chow before my French class at 9. Having accomplished this, I proceeded across campus to Holden Hall, which is basically the east wing of a bigger building. The west wing of the building is called Norris Hall. French class started, and I think we we're talking about Sarkozy and the upcoming French elections, when we started hearing the weird sounds of the PA system outside. The week before had included some minor disruptions to our schedule in the form of prank bomb scares, and we'd figure some idiot was at it again. No big deal. Boy, were we wrong. About five minutes later, we see some cop cars pulled up outside, and about a minute after that, we see more cop cars pull up along with a big van, and out of the van comes several men dressed in full black body armor with that what looks like M16s, so, so maybe not a bomb scare anymore. At this point, our instructor was having some trouble keeping us focused on our lesson anymore and sort of allowed us to watch what was going on, and someone said we should turn on the TV to see if there was any information on the news. The information wasn't totally clear from the TV, but it seemed that someone had shot eight people on the campus. A and I remember, I remember us talking and saying there was no way that it was this many people. At this point, I decided I should call my mother. I whipped out my phone, not caring that we were still in class, and dialed her up at work. Thankfully, she answered. Hey mom, are you watching the news right now? No, I'm at work. I know, you should probably turn it on, but I want to let you know I'm okay before the phone stopped working. I recalled from after 9-11 that everyone and their mothers was trying to call loved ones that day, so the cell grid was basically overloaded and most calls wouldn't go through, and I assumed the same thing was going to happen here. Even if nothing had actually happened, the grid did go down later. I said goodbye and also called my friend Allie to make sure that she was okay especially since she lived in the same building that I'd seen the ambulance at earlier. She was fine, and I went back to watching the news. It came to light at this point that there had apparently been more than one shooting incident at the school, at Allie's building, Wes AJ, and now at Norris Hall, which we'd already figured out on our own. Looking out the window at the ever-growing sea of cop cars below us, on Drill Field Drive and on the field itself, we suddenly hear outside the windows from the other end of the building, crack, crack, crack. We all looked at each other 
And suddenly this was way more serious. This was real. People were being shot inside of our building. At this point, we decided that maybe we should be a little more proactive about our whole entire situation. We turned the lights off, turned the TV off, and start rearranging the furniture in the room to block the door. Though admittedly, the makeshift barricade probably wouldn't have stopped a really determined person from getting inside since the door had frosted glass on its upper half instead of being solid. We figured that this is better than nothing though and sit down on the floor near the front of the room talking to each other in hushed tones. After about 15 minutes, we hear footsteps outside the room. Everyone freezes and no one makes a sound. I remember looking up from the floor towards the door, wondering if this was it. Is this how I die? A few seconds later, we hear a tap on the door in a deep voice. This is Deputy So-and-So and the such-and-such -such Sheriff's Department. Stay where you are. Leave your lights off and stay quiet. We'll be back for you as soon as we can. This was not a member of either the pol police on the campus or the Blacksburg police, but from looking out the window, we already knew that there were cops there from everywhere within driving distance. We all look around at each other in solemn silence. We'd all just been thinking the same thing before the deputy had spoken. Thankfully, he hadn't asked us to open the door because I don't think anyone would have ever gone up from where they were sitting. We stayed down and quiet for a couple more hours. I can't really remember what it was we talked about while I was there, since we were all so keyed up. It's been a long time waiting, and then we hear footsteps again outside the door. This time, we saw the evidence of who the man was before he spoke. A gold badge pressed up against the frosted glass assured us that he was legitimate. This is Deputy So-and-So again, it's time to go. We all quietly got up and grabbed our backpacks. A couple of guys in the class, myself included, start pulling the tables away from the door as quickly and as quietly as we could, and then we cracked the door. I, I think on some level, all of us expected that this was a trick, but when we opened the door, standing a few feet away was a sheriff's deputy in uniform with a sidearm drawn and held at his side. He held his fingers up to his lips, indicating that we should be quiet, and he dropped his voice to a whisper. You're going to walk down as quietly as you can. There are two more cops by the door outside. They know you're coming. Just walk straight outside and don't stop. He nodded at us, and we started making our way downstairs. He got on his radio and signaled, Students coming out. When we got to the midway landing, we could see the front door cracked and a cop peering in. Walking up to the door, he opened it wider to let us pass, and as he did, he looked straight at us and said very quietly but very seriously, after signaling the radio, Run! Walking out that door in the morning light, I was greeted by a sight I will never forget. I have never seen so many cop cars in one place in my whole entire life, and honestly, I hope I never have to again. There were easily two or three hundred crown vics and a smattering of additional vans, trucks, and command center vehicles, crowding every inch of space starting about a hundred feet from that door. In front of those vehicles stood a flanex of at least forty officers armed with M16s and even a couple of MP5s directly in our path. As soon as we were outside, the several cops to the left and right of this formation waved at us in an unmistakable gesture to move your ass. We ran off to the left of the cops with the big guns, over drill field drive, and onto the drill field itself, and didn't stop until we were almost to the other side. I read the news online after I got to my dorm. MSNBC had something at the bottom of an article that said something like, if you have any information about this, please contact us. Thinking little of it, I emailed them with my contact info and within 10 minutes, my phone absolutely blew up. I was beset with interview requests and questions from at least 20 different people and actually arranged to meet their news crews down at the inn that evening. I ended up doing two national interviews, one on Scarborough Country and another with Geraldo Rivera the second with my two friends who had agreed to accompany me down to the circus that the inn had become. I did a few more for some local radio stations and had some print news before deciding that I had had quite enough for the day and went to my dorm to get some sleep. I hadn't really been sold on the whole college experience up until that point, but strangely enough, if anything, the whole experience seemed to bring me and my friends closer together for that last month at school. Luckily for me, no one I knew was heard beyond a friend of a friend breaking his leg badly from jumping out the window, and one guy I didn't know from my art history class was killed. The rest of the tragedy is part of the public record as you may know. It's, I'm sad to say that I left Virginia Tech after that year for completely unrelated reasons and have always missed it. 
but I still talk to my friends from that first year and I miss both the place and their company. Virginia Tech seems to have had a horrible patch of bad luck starting in 2006 and lasting for a few years, but also including a really gruesome beheading in a dining hall, an accidental death, and suicide. A close call with carbon monoxide poisoning for the entire cheerleading team at the inn, all in the year following the big shooting. They also had a couple who were attending the school abducted and murdered a few years ago, but IRC, it happened farther north in the States. Luckily, I never experienced any of that. I think I fulfilled my quota of random bad luck at least for a while. Cho Sheng Hui, I'm really glad we never met, and also that we never will. Shooter at the airport. I'm sorry for any mistakes this may have since my English is not my first language. A friend told me you guys would be interested in the story so for a while. I've just been reading some to be less shy about posting. This is a story about something that happened to me and my grandma when I was 6 or 7 years old. So 2001 or 2002. For context, I'm a girl and at the time, I was living in a city that was somewhat small but is politically important so it always had an airport. My aunt was flying in and as she had lived in another town for ages, we were very excited to welcome her at the airport. We made our way to the gate, people came out. After picking up their luggage, not sure if this has a name in English, but to describe it, it had sliding glass doors so you could see people getting the luggage or something. I remember very being very chatty while waiting, and at some point, my grandma grabbed my hand real hard and gave me a look, then just said shut up. I thought I'd said something wrong, but after a while, I realized she was trying to listen to the people that were standing right next to us. They seem to be fighting a lot. Also, my grandma has always been very gossipy. I looked over at them and they were an old man and a very pregnant woman and they were just discussing something which really didn't interest a 6 or 7 year old me so I ignored it. And now some things get fuzzy in my memory so I will tell you what I remember and then what my grandma told me happened. I remember hearing the old man scream something like, There he is! I'm gonna get him over and over until this man comes out of the sliding glass doors. Then I just remember that all people around start screaming and my grandma threw me in the ground and laid on top of me. I heard noises like fireworks and screams and feeling suffocated both by my grandma and some sort of weird smell and also by how hot it was under her so I was feeling really bad and started screaming. I tried to push her off of me and for a moment raised my head and saw a lot of red close to my face on the ground and lots of people laying down as well with their hands on their heads. Everything smelled bad and hot. I don't really know how to describe it. At this point, my grandma pushed my head quite forcefully to the ground and whispered, Stop and play dead now, in the most serious voice I've ever heard from her. I didn't understand what was happening before that and was quite angry with my grandma for being so forceful. But as she said this, I began to understand that this was serious and I got really quiet really fast while trying not to cry. At some point, she got off of me but carried me to stay behind with a large pillar. I remember being very shaky in the legs as if I had no strength and there was a police officer there who told, told me everything was going to be alright. There were other people there who looked scared too and they just sat down in silence for some time while we heard police talking and the old man crying and screaming very loudly. Then it got really quiet and I remember being taken to a room where I had to say what I knew to more officers for a while until we could go. When they took me there, and an officer used his hand to cover my eyes in a way, and I remember feeling just angry and tired of being handled around, tried to take his hands off and saw just for a moment the pregnant woman lying on her back. This image is forever in my head since that day. Now for the details my grandma told me later on. She told me what happened only a few years back. At the time this took place, she had just explained to me that a very bad man did bad stuff, but he was arrested and I shouldn't worry. But as she explained recently, what happened was that the old man was the woman's father and apparently she was very young and got pregnant by this guy, I call him Dick, who then just ran away and abandoned her. He was coming back because she had recently been in touch and he had reconsidered about being a dad, except when her father found out about this, he was very angry and decided to take revenge on Dick for leaving in the first place. My grandma said she learned this was on the news later, but in the airport she heard the father talking about how Dick ruined her life and had to pay, and how he wasn't going to let anyone treat her like that, and she kept telling him that she loved the guy, that he had come around to not do anything. As you may have guessed, her father had a gun, and as the dick came out of the glass door with his luggage, he whipped it out. Except he didn't just kill that guy. Apparently, he was either too emotional 
or had never done it before and couldn't aim right and hurt some other people who took grazing bullets or got shot in non-fatal places. While this is happening, the woman keeps screaming that she loves the baby and her baby daddy, and when her dad managed to aim right, she threw herself in the way. Both her dick and the baby got killed instantly. My grandma said that this happened really fast, and the police showed up right when he shot them. This is when the old guy calms down a bit, or at least isn't trying to shoot anyone anymore, so there's a lot of police trying to get the gun from him, and people start to get up and hide. It takes a few minutes, but he lets go of the gun, probably sad at his daughter and grandchild's death, and the police take him finally. I think it took the police some time to show up, because at the time, it was a very small airport, in general, very low crimes and such. My grandma said the whole thing happened in a total of about 20 minutes only, but to me it felt like ages. As I only talked to my grandma recently, I hadn't realized how close we had been to the old man and his daughter, and that when I saw red just a few inches from my nose, I probably saw someone who had been hurt so, so close to me and was putting myself in danger trying to push her off like that. I'm forever grateful that she protected me so well that I hadn't even realized the situation we were in until recently. I've been trying to find any sort of mention of this in any news sites, and if I can, I'll link it or something. But so far, I haven't found anything since it's from 2001, and our local newspaper was and still is quite small. Maybe I'll find something at the library? I don't know. My encounter with a shooting. This is my first story submitted. I apologize in advance that I'm a very good storyteller. I'm not even sure if this fits here, but here it goes. So, one night I was in bed trying to sleep. I think I was 9 or 10 years old at the time, and I heard a loud bang. It sounded like it was coming from downstairs in the kitchen. So I thought, uh, something probably fell off a shelf or something. I didn't think anything of it, although it freaked me out because, well, a sound, a loud sound especially, in the middle of the night, would freak anyone out. I was just gonna go back to sleep when I heard the noise again. My immediate thought was, oh no, a gun. My dad heard it too. He had woken up, but he didn't turn the lights on. So then my kinda nosy aunt comes out of her room and turns on the lights in the hallway. My dad realizes it was two gunshots, so he called the police. The police came and investigated. It turned out the guns was shot at my aunt's window. If she hadn't put her head down at that second, she probably would have been shot in the brain. And even as much as I didn't like her, I would still be kind of upset if she was. My dad says he looked out the window to see a white car driving away. The bullet went through the window, through the wall on the other side, through the shower, and onto the stairwell. We were interviewed by the news about what had happened. We no, no longer live there now. My dad told me that the house has since been shot up another time, but he thinks it has to do with my aunt's teenage son, my cousin Josh. He thinks it's one of his friends or something, dang. I wouldn't be surprised if people that bought the house moved out. I don't want to live in a house that was getting shot up, right? I was actually afraid for a while that it would ever happen again. Edit. I have another story. One day, I was outside in the front yard, looking at the rocks that were there. You might understand this better. If I tell you about the weird neighbors, the neighbors on the left side on my house are just, well, to be honest, they're just weird. They have, I think, two teenager young adult boys. So anyways, I was just sitting there and one of them kind of drives up to me. Don't get out or try to touch me and says, hey, little girl, want some candy? I was so scared. After that, they drove away laughing. After it happened, I was too scared to go outside again. Now, mind you, this happened in broad daylight. That's why I don't like teenage boys.